That's fine with me if it's fine with you, Eddie. Yeah, sounds good. Trickoli is fine, just like a bullet. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, so, um, thanks everyone for coming to the second day. I did some research this morning on uh, other things that happened in 1980, apart from the first publication of Science Without Numbers. So I'd like to share some of them with you, just to put things in context. Uh, Pac-Man was first invented in 1980, as was the Rubik's Cube. CNN was launched. Uh, John Lennon, Peter Sellers, Alfred Hitchcock, and Steve McQueen all died. Uh, the Talking Heads released Remain in Light, uh, and Joy Division released Closer, and then Ian Curtis died a couple months later. Um, and my personal favorite is My Parents Met in 1980. Uh, just to, so just to put science without numbers in its appropriate historical context. Um, so we're gonna proceed today just like uh, we did yesterday, roughly. So um, there are three talks today. Each of them are going to be relatively short. So like 25 to 30 minutes, I believe, uh, after which we'll open things up to questions. Um, and then at the end uh, of the affair, um, there will be a, we'll, we'll open it up to questions more broadly, um, a discussion more broadly. Uh, so our first speaker today is um, Eddie Chen uh, from UCSD, who's going to talk to us about um, intrinsicality and the hardest road to nominalism. All right. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you all for coming today. I know it's still, you know, uh, unnerving day, but um, um, well, second and final day of the conference, my topic is on intrinsicness or intrinsicality, which I think is a central theme from uh, science without numbers. However, before I start, I want to uh, have a slide for this special occasion. Um, well, 1980, 40 years ago, uh, today we're here to celebrate, socially distant way, the 40th, uh, 40th birthday of Hartree's book, uh, Science without numbers. So here is the birthday card to you. <laughs> um, all right, so back to intrinsicality. So, so this is an important topic, but I want to start with um, just two intuitive questions to get us started to thinking about this. And if you haven't read the book, this might be uh, a bit unfamiliar, but if you've read the book, recognize what's going on here, right? So suppose, um, you were to ask me the following two questions. First, what is the structure of Euclidean space? I might say, well, let's put on a Cartesian coordinate system with an arbitrary origin and arbitrary orientations of the axis X, Y, Z for three-dimensional space. But if you ask me what's really going on, what is the intrinsic structure of Euclidean space? The kind of structure that Euclid was thinking about, right? The fundamental structure of Euclidean space, three-dimensional space. So I want to ask you, what do you mean exactly by intrinsic? What do you mean by describing something intrinsically? Second question related to this is uh, the case of mass, Newtonian mass. Suppose um, I see a bunch of dinosaurs and um, I ask you, okay, what is the mass of the dinosaur, T-Rex? And um, um, well, I can describe the dinosaur in terms of pro uh, the property of mass in kilogram, right? So I say um, it has the mass, it has the property of having mass of 8,000 kilograms. So that's particularly in a system kg. And my American friend might say, well, it has the following uh, mass in pounds, 17,636.96 to be exact, pounds, right? So it's a property of having this number uh, in pounds in mass. But obviously, kg and pounds are two unit systems. They're equivalent, with the describing equivalent state of affairs. That is, this dinosaur has the certain mass. Now, um, we can describe the mass of a dinosaur using the equivalence class, right? So we can say it has following mass, um, and we can describe uh, and point to what they have in common. We can say it is this equivalence class of properties. Properties maybe in quote, right? 
So, um, right, you have other, you know, equivalence classes. So my iPad is about uh, two kg and 4.4 pounds. And that's another class in the, the bunch of equivalence classes. Or you can describe it intrinsically in terms of the comparative relations, such as mass between us and mass sum. So the mass um, that is my iPad is between the dinosaur and my iPhone in terms of mass. And the dinosaur is the mass sum of uh, thousands of iPads. And those relations are competitive relations. They are invariant on the different choices of the unit. That is, no matter what unit you put on, the relations always hold. But what exactly is it to describe something intrinsically? Does this have a univocal meaning? Does it have something kind of clear we can uh, sink our teeth into? Right? Well, I want to confess that I find the notion of intrinsicality to be difficult to make precise. But it's a fruitful notion nonetheless, right? In scientific and metaphysical theorizing. There is a strong connection to the notion of gauge in physics, but they're not the same. Um, okay. Well, actually, the notion of gauge in physics is not so clear either, right? They are, it's a debate in philosophy of physics about how do you understand the notion of gauge, the notion of surplus structure, access structure, or redundant degrees of freedom. Um, intrinsic, intrinsicalism, the idea that we want to pursue or want to construct theory that are intrinsic, um, is one of the main motivations for Hartree Field's program outlined in Science with the Numbers. In this talk, I attempt to discuss, clarify, and classify several different but related notions of intrinsicality used within and outside Fields program. I suggest there are three kinds of intrinsicality. They're relevant. Now, all of them are in Fields program, but I think they should be relevant to the goal of Fields program. But also they appear elsewhere, uh, such as in uh, foundations of quantum mechanics and foundations of statistical mechanics. So the first notion is intrinsicality as invariance. The second notion is gauge-free invariance, a stronger notion than just invariance. The third notion is non-arbitrariness in some specific way I'm going to define later. Now, the key examples I'm going to use uh, are two things I am, I'm familiar with, which is one, intrinsic quantum mechanics and the intrinsic path hypothesis. I am not going to discuss intrinsic in the sense of David Lewis, although it could be related, it's not the same either, right? It's a property of properties. Um, and it's a property of duplication, perfect naturalness, and so on. Okay, we'll start by discussing the connection to Fields program. All right. So um, Hartree Fields, signed on the numbers, has two motivations. One, to formulate things, for, uh, physical theories nominalistically, i.e. without reference to mathematical objects, without quantifying over mathematical objects. And two, to formulate physical theories intrinsically, i.e. without ref uh, referring to arbitrary conventions, units, measures, coordinate systems, and the like. To resolving all the conventional elements in the theory. The nominalistic requirement is motivated further by a desire to defend nominalism against the indispensability argument for the existence of mathematical objects. And this is mentioned by um, Mark Hollivan's talk yesterday. If we can formulate, if you can reformulate physical theories, say in textbook, um, quantum mechanics, classical mechanics, and relativity, if you can reformulate them without referring to mathematical objects, then they are not indispensable after all, undercutting the uh, premise in the indispensability argument, so they will not be sound anymore. And there's a huge discussion about this following um, Field's book and also before Field's book. And there's also the divergence between the easy road and the hard road. And not only the requirement amounts to and so on. I won't address this directly, but I want to kind of propose uh, certain discussions about intrinsicality that might shed light on the difficulty that is, is actually even more difficult than we realize. All right, but I, in the end, I'm optimistic about whether it can be carried out. So the intrinsicalist requirement plays an equally crucial role in the field program, um, equally crucial as, uh, as crucial as nominalistic uh, requirement. 
It is an essential methodological principle that's supposed to appeal to both nominalists and Platonists. It is both people, both camps on debate are going to agree. We want to have something like this. This, this is desirable, this is making the theory good. So um, in the book, I actually uh, found a few uh, quotes about related to intrinsicness or intrinsicality. And the page number is coming from the second edition of the book, size of the numbers. Several notion in connection to intrinsicality feels as non arbitrariness avoiding conventional choices, avoiding arbitrary mathematical functions. Oh, this is interesting, avoiding causally irrelevant entities. This is discussed in Mark's talk too. And talk about intrinsicness, intrinsic effects, intrinsic relations, intrinsic explanations, purely intrinsic. In my view, there are two aspects of uh, Field's notion of intrinsicality. The first one is non-arbitrariness, the resolving out of arbitrary conventions in the theory. The second is causal relevance. Say, for example, explaining what happens in this region of space-time by what, what, what is in this region of space-time. So numbers like two is not in this region of space-time. So it's not really re relevant, causally speaking, to the events here. And that's kind of a rough uh, gloss, but um, there are more discussion about this in the book. Now, my feeling is that the requirement for causal relevance derives in part from nominalism, the idea that um, there is question about um, mathematical objects, how they're related to physical ob objects. The distinctive aspect of intrin intrinsicality, I think, is a demand for non-arbitrariness, so one. So I have a focus on non-arbitrariness for two reasons. One, I think, is doing the heavy lifting in Fields program to construct some attractive physical theory, right? Not just any physical theory, but attractive one, equally attractive or more attractive than the Platonist counterpart. And two, it is also more closely related to the notions of invariances in physics, in foundations of physics. So it can be theoretically fruitful to explore this independently of this debate of nominalism. All right. Oh, here's something of historical interest. Um, a letter from Quine to a field uh, printed in the second edition of the book. I'm going to just read the first few paragraphs. So Hartree uh, sent the book to Quine, and Quine received the book and read it in one morning, or one day, right? Um, so dear Hartree, here's uh, Quine saying, dear Hartree, your book came yesterday morning, and I sent a day at it. It is an impressive piece of work, reasonable, ingenious, learned, and as central philosophically as can be. Moreover, he appeals to my predilections, for as you know, must know I am a nominalist man cave from way back, and a reluctant planet's only in honest recognition of what have seemed to be the demands of science. This is important. Um, so what you count as nominalism is a question of no great importance, though I shall get back to it. More important is the ontological economy and relative homogeneity that you achieve, whatever one's view of the objects that you keep. Here's my emphasis. More important still, perhaps, is the economy of the theory that you gain by what you call intrinsic formulation. Namely, the resolving out of conventional units and measures in favor of the objective invariances that, that underlie the quantitative laws. So here's a little autobiography. So I agree with Quine's assessment of the book. It's very important, and also I agree that What's really attractive here is this intrinsic formulation of physical theory that's emphasized in the book. And that should be kind of uh, something that can apply across the board in other contexts as well. And reading Hartree's book uh, in graduate school, I remember it changed my views about Platonism and nominalism. Um, but what's really attractive to me is the intrinsicalist vision. I think it is continuous with some of the important developments in the foundations of physics, and it is theoretically fruitful. Hence, I'm interested in extending Field's program, whether or not it succeeds in defending nominalism. Of course, if it does, that's great. If not, it's still interesting. Now, zooming out a bit. So for me, as a realist metaphysician of science, I aim to offer a picture from the reality that's in part overlapping with, I think, Field's vision in the book. So the first three components are A, consistent. So no inconsistencies. Uh, no inconsistency between the Schrodinger equation on the one hand, and the collapse rule for measurement axioms on the other. Be precise. Well, I think this is defeasible given 
uh, my view about normal vagueness you now, but I think it's important to keep in mind that we do want to have a theory that's as precise as possible, other things being equal, right? No imprecision, no fuzziness in the theory, if we can make it. And C, observer free. So there should be no place for observers, measure, measurement um, devices or human beings to be the center of physical universe, determining uh, how things play out. And A and C are the reasons that I'm interested in solution the quantum measurement problem to soon discuss. Now the following two, gauge free and abstract free. So gauge free, I use the sense that it's one-to-one -one correspondence between the mathematical representation and the physical reality. There's no surplus structure. Every degree of freedom is physical, representing something physical. And abstract free, I think it's negotiable. For nominalists, it is not negotiable. Um, I do want to have uh, uh, to be few in abstracta. If there's non abstracta, that's great. So, the idea, the reason I'm interested in intrinsic and non nonalist formulation of, of physical theories. I also do want to have a uh, clear physical ontology, fundamental ontology of, of what's going on. Ontology plus ideology, the properties and predicates that correspond to fundamental properties. Um, so, that's why I want to say we should resist the casual identification of equivalent theories and go deeper in a way that I'll explain soon. Okay. Now, let me just mention a few intrinsically programs in foundations of physics. So there is an approach in space-time theories that we want to make sure we're not relying on particular coordinate systems, right? The laws are coordinate independent in some way. So there is the coordinate independent formulation for space-time theories. Um, and there's also in the, in the theory of mechanics, and how things move, right? Uh, there is the uh, Barborian Julian Barber's project of relational classical mechanics that he focused on um, shapes of objects. So we have objects, particles, and so on. They have configurations. Now, the absolute, conf absolute configuration includes things like uh, translation, um, rotation, and distances. There are fundamental degrees of freedom, basically, right? But if you are a barber or a Marky and Leibnizian relationalist about space time, you think that what's fundamental should be the shapes of things. So you have intrinsic shapes in fundamental, and laws relate intrinsic shape to each other by this best matching principle. And this recent extension is really exciting to me, at least, of Barber's idea of best matching to quantum mechanics in the realist, um, observer free, precise version of Bohmian mechanics. There's this beautiful paper. Uh, in archive and also published in Journal of Statistical Physics quant uh, called Quantum Motion on Shape Space and the Gauge Dependent Emergence of Dynamics and Probability in Absolute Space Time, Space and Time by uh, Bowman researchers Dedlock Dewar, Sheldon Goldstein, Nilos Zemgi. It's a beautiful paper, I recommend you read it. Um, but the basic idea is that they emphasize on intrinsic explanation, the intrinsic stuff in the theory. Bowman mechanics, even though it's great, it's not deep enough. The deep explanation is something else. It's an intrinsic um, description of ontology and laws in terms of shapes. That's what's basic, fundamental, intrinsic. Now in physics, the notion of gauge is flexible. This notion of gauge in gauge theories and gauge field theories. The notion of gauge I'm looking for here is the kind of surplus structure kind of gauge and which might be different from the gauge in the field theories. The notion of gauge I'm thinking about is the notion of gauge about coordinate systems, the abs absolute origin, orientation, and so on. And in general, we don't need degrees of freedom or access structure or surplus structure in the theory. They don't correspond to physical degrees of freedom. So in some physical theories, there's a clear cut division between physical degrees of freedom and redundant degrees of freedom. So choosing um, a particular coordinate system can be thought of as choosing a particular way of fixing the gauge, right? Um, so the, but we know that in Euclidean space, the orientation and the place of origin of the Cartesian coordinate system is arbitrary, is conventional, doesn't correspond to anything real. So we want to know what's really going on regardless of the gauge we choose, regardless of the coordinate system we choose. What's really going on in Euclidean space? What's the fundamental structure here? So the first grade of intrinsicality, intrinsic one, is the following notion. is gauge independence 
or gauge invariance. So notion of quantity is intrinsic one if it's invariant on the choices of gauge. Now this definition is a bit vague because you might have different definitions of gauge. You might have different strength and uh, strength for intrinsic one. But I mean, the intuitive idea is that um, suppose you have um, uh, various coordinate systems um, and any theory that privileges a coordinate system in Euclidean space is not gauge uh, independent, right? Okay, so then a theory is intrinsic one if every basic notion in the theory um, or quantity in the theory is intrinsic one. Now intrinsic one theory is desirable because we want our theory to describe only physical quantities and properties. And moreover, from the laws of physics, we think only involve the uh, quantities and properties that are not dependent on conventional choices of gauge. So we want to use them to formulate from the laws of physics. Well, actually the first grade of intrinsic quality can be easily achieved by using what's called equivalence classes. So start from the gauge dependent node quantities, right? So we have uh, one kg and 2.2 .2 pounds, suppose we want to have a theory of dinosaurs, right? And you can say the following, um, any sentence in the theory uh, or any uh, predicate in the theory, you can have a equivalence class. Whenever you see one kg put in the same class as 2.2 .2 pounds, whenever you see two kg, same class as 4.4 um, .4 pounds, as two different properties, but they're in the same equivalence class. So we can take an equivalence class of various gauge dependent quantities and say, okay, whatever this have in common is the invariant thing. Whatever this in, have in common is the invariant thing. So the mass of the dinosaur is whatever 8,000 kg and I forgot 17,000 pounds have in common, right? So another example is that we can take um, the equivalence class of quantity systems related to each other by Euclidean transformation and say um, the Euclidean structure of space is whatever in common um, had by things in equivalence class. Or in other case of quantum mechanics, we have wave functions deferred by overall phase. We take equivalence classes of wave functions and say, um, the quantum state is whatever, have, whatever structure has had in common by the different representations of the same equivalence class. Now, this leaves some of us unhappy, unsatisfied with question marks, right? <clears throat> in virtue of what are the members of the equivalence class equivalent? At this step, we cannot just appeal to the fact that they are in the same equivalence class for that would be circular. So the question is really, what structure in the physical world allows such a procedure taking the equivalence class? What justifies the equivalence of various theories or um, uh, equivalence classes? We want a deeper explanation. Can we appeal to observational equivalence? Well, that's maybe doable in, in the context of discovery, right? We use that to uh, discover various equivalences, but not all observational equivalent theories are theoretically equivalent. In some sense, um, Bohm theory and every theory uh, may be called observational equivalent insofar as the observations are made precise, but they're two different theories, right? Many worlds, single world, and so on and so forth. So we want a deeper explanation. And I think the key to that is a second grade of intrinsicality. Intrinsic two theories provide explanation for intrinsic one equivalences. The second grade of intrinsicality is gauge free invariance. Is there a more demanding notion it requires not only the independence of particular choices of gauge, but also the complete avoidance of letting gauge appear in any part of the formulation at all. So um, a theory is intrinsic two is every basic notion and on quantity theory is intrinsic two. Intrinsic two theories desirable because they describe physical quantities and probably in a way that provides perspicuous explanations for the gauge freedom. Let me give you one example. Oh, sorry, not yet. Okay. Um, intrinsicality two uh, is much more demanding and much harder to achieve than intrinsicality one. Um, so you cannot resort to taking equivalence classes of gate dependent notions. So when they have, um, say, 
one kg and 2.2 pounds, equivalence class doesn't tell you what's had in common. You don't have explicit demonstration or explicit construction of what is fundamental quantity had in common, right? Um, this things, suppose we have a, a theory of mass, theory of dinosaurs. Uh, this theory will still invoke various um, gauge dependent notions, even though we take them to be equivalence class of them, right? So this pounds and kg, the gauges are still appear somewhere in the theory, even though they're in the equivalence class. So um, Ted Sauter in his new book, um, The Tools of Metaphysics and the Metaphysical Science, um, talk about this issue in the context of discussing different approaches to theoretical equivalence caused the procedure of taking equivalence classes in quote quotienting, right? So um, that is, suppose we have one kg and 2.2 pounds and the quotienting person says, okay, that's dumb. My theory of mass is dinosaur is dumb. Now, um, the more demanding thing is to say, okay, what exactly is had in common by these two uh, unit systems? So how do you achieve intrinsicality too without using quotienting? Well, we can do this by explicitly identifying and describing the structure of things have in common in the equivalence class. In case of Newtonian mass. So um, we have the following idea that suggestion is that the common structure is invariant under the multiplicative transformation. So we have you know, one kg to 2.2 pounds, it's like m to am, where a is a positive real. And this transformation is maybe a um, equivalence transformation, right? Take use to, um, to uh, another equivalent, equivalent description of the same um, state of affairs. So this suggests a mass on the ratio scale by applying the Krenz kind of axioms, we can get um, the following proposal. That is, we can propose to understand mass without referring to gauge dependent notions. We have two intrinsic two relations, mass between us and mass sum. So what's really invariant, what's really fundamental is, you know, um, the dinosaur um, is uh, between, you know, my iPad and, um, you know, Earth in mass. And Earth in mass is uh, heavier uh, than iPad and so on. So a mass sum, you have, I uh, say, um, the iPad is the mass sum of two iPhones. All right, and then we have axioms governing the behavior. It's supposed to be uh, well-functioning axioms. Then we can have representation theorems and unique theorem to recover using those two intrinsic relations, recover the quantitative representations of individual unit systems unique up to the multiplicative transformations by positive real. Right. So this last fact connects the gauge-free intrinsic two facts to gauge independent intrinsic one facts. So how to recover um, the unit system from this is by two theorems. And we know that this two, if this is a good one, then this is a good one. Okay. Now, intrinsicality two is hard to achieve, but it's not impossible. It has been done for various parts of theories. So in fields which in the book, chapter six to eight, he has done uh, the intrinsicality formulation for parts of Newton gravitational theory. And um, Frank and Sienz, Key and Dor formulate parts of differential manifold theory in terms of intrinsic descriptions of various sum relations, between this relation, congruent relations, and so on. So in my own work, I should do the same thing for non relativist quantum mechanics. I call this intrinsic quantum mechanics, or intrinsic QM. So the idea is this. The idea is that when we say there's equivalence class of wave functions, we uh, think of that suggesting the structure, whatever is in common, is invariant under the overall phase transformation. I call this the periodic difference structure. And it consists in the following relations, um, m to sum, m to greater than equal to, phase congruence and phase clockwise between us. The four intrinsic relations on space-time regions. The relata are going to be uh, meological fusions of endpoints in space. Any endpoints in space can be in relata. Or if you don't like meological fusions or meology, you can just take um, endpoints in space as relata. So it can be a very long argument places, many arity 
predicate. And from this, we can use representation unique theorem to recover the wave functions uniquely after the overall phase transformation. Actually, it's uh, two uh, real value functions that give you the complex numbers. Great. Now, besides being not uh, intrinsic, it goes uh, some way towards uh, answering elements worry that quantum mechanical states cannot be nominalized. Um, so um, here is the quote from the end of Mellman's um, critical review of Field's book, 1982. That is, doesn't see um, how Field can get studied at all. And uh, the reason is that he thinks of the theory determining a set of models each a Hilbert space. Right? And the propositions in Hilbert space are kind of abstract possibilities. So he doesn't think they are kosher nominalistically. But here we have something else, right? We have space time in fundamental. Relations are relations on space time regions or space time points. And, um, and that's why we don't need uh, to invoke the Hilbert space to recover the quantum mechanical structure. Although we have the laws of physics, right? Schrodinger equation or Gardner's equation, together they can recover the state space, configuration space and Hilbert space via representation theorems. Um, plus, you know, some logical operator like compatibility and so on. And also go towards answering Motlin's criticism of the David Albert, Barry Lower, Lisa Ney, and Jill North's version of wave quantum realism, high dimensional uh, version that the quantum state represents the field in physical uh, in configuration space. And Motlin thinks that that's uh, raised by too much structure, redundancy with the freedom of overall phase. But if they have my strategy, they can have comparative relations on configuration space. And that will give you intrinsic characterization of the high dimensional field. So there's no redundancy with freedom here. Now, it's only to kind of take a um, brief moment to answer. So Hellman and Leung raised two insightful objections to the intrinsic QM in a critical study of a second edition of Field's book. And um, so to kind of address these two objections very quickly. Uh, the first objection is that we did normalization and synchronicity of the universal wave function, but that's a red herring and too removed from working physics. Well, that's right in some sense, but it's not red herring for the nominalistic project. Remember, we focus on the fundamental ontology of what's basically real, right? Focus on what's fundamental. In the subsystem quantum states that are more useful to us in the labs can be derived from the universal state. And given uh, entanglement and given, you know, the Schrodinger equation, um, the um, uh, universal wave, wave function is the more fundamental one. And moreover, the subsystem quantum states can be, have the same infrastructure structure as the universal one. <clears throat> the second objection is that we need a whole space of universal wave function to recover counterfactual or causal reasoning. This is a very interesting question. And I think that's probably traced on different conceptions of what fundamental physical theory should uh, look like. So in my view, um, counterfactuals are not fundamental. So uh, Pace, Mark Land, I don't think counterfactuals are kind of basic conceptually ontologically. Um, I think of them as derived from ontology plus laws plus logic. Um, and um, so if you have that view, it doesn't actually matter if you cannot have them in the fundamental level. Um, but moreover, there is a question, right? Suppose you have a view that the fundamental quantum state is a law of, a law of nature. The kind of factuals involving wave functions, even possible wave functions are counter legals. They're not kind of factuals. Now, what we really need is a quantum past hypothesis to support kind of factual reasoning in quantum mechanical world. Um, not a whole space of wave functions, but a quantum past hypothesis, a particular class of wave functions. And there are questions about the nature of, of the probability because you need to have um, a statistical posture to rule out some kind of anti-entropic wave functions. But it's a kind of a question about how to answer this uh, issue. Is it to double down or to try something else? So there's an interesting um, route to this, namely, if you take what I uh, so um, call the initial projection hypothesis, you don't have to worry about B and C because um, that is taken care of by the initial density matrix as a uh, uh, real fundamental quantum state density matrix. Okay, so lots of issues here I don't have time to address, just want to flag them. Okay, brief summary before go to intrinsic three. So maybe the first kind of 
uh, intrinsicality one and two are all there is to intrinsicality. If so, we're done, right? If so, being intrinsic is the same or it is almost the same as being gauge independent or being completely gauge free. But rather, but remember, intrinsicality derived from the notion of non-arbitrariness. Arbitrariness shows up in choosing redundant so plus degrees of freedom, so connection to gauge, but gauge does not exhaust the notion of arbitrariness. Why is that? The cases of arbitrariness do not correspond to gauge degrees of freedom. An important case comes up again in the past hypothesis. All right. So the third grade of intrinsicality is to take care of this arbitrariness. So this is the absence of untraceable arbitrariness. And this notion I'll explain shortly. But let me just go, go through one example and the background of the past hypothesis. So um, given the widespread climate symmetry in the world, uh, we see we have good reason to think that fundamental physics without a past hypothesis is incomplete. Newtonian mechanics, F equals MA, the Schrodinger equation are not complete description of physical reality in the sense that they don't entail all the important regularities we see. So there's the influential school of argument, I think, starting from Feynman and then continuing to Albert and Kellen and others, um, arguing that the past hypothesis should be added to the fundamental laws of nature. It should be additional fundamental law of nature constraining possibility space. Okay. And if this is the case, um, well, I'm gonna take this as the assumption in this talk, but we can argue about this in Q&A. But in any case, I think there's a good ground for claiming the pH is an axiom in the theory. If it's not a law, if you don't like to be a law, it's a fundamental axiom that is without this, you cannot derive the second law of thermodynamics and to the increase in the various kinds of asymmetrical laws in physical sciences. So here's one version of the past hypothesis. I call it the weak past hypothesis. And what's important here is that this is a phase space, space of possibilities. And the past hypothesis says the initial microstate, X0, starts in a particular region of phase space, a low entropy region corresponding to a low uh, volume part of phase space, called this M0. So initially, the universe had low entropy. It's expressed by this uh, proposition that X0 is in M0. But the problem is that M0 has fuzzy boundaries because this is mechanics, all the parameters are kind of fuzzy, right? They're not uh, sharp. They're only sharp given some conventional choices of um, cutoff and coarse, coarse grading and the like. <clears throat> now, what if you prefer a precise kind of law, precise axiom in front of the theory? You say, what about a precise set of microstates, gamma zero, precise by the fuzzy vague region of M0 and says, here's a red one. X0 is a set member of the set gamma zero, where gamma zero is a precise set with precise boundaries. There is in fact, precification of gamma zero privileged by nature and call this a strong pass hypothesis. So initially the universe had a microstate, and the microstate is a member of this precise set gamma zero. But I claim, SPH strong path hypothesis is implausible. Why? The exact choice of gamma zero is arbitrary in objectable sense. It amounts to an exact size of cells for coarse graining, exact correspondence, exact cutoff in the case of quantum mechanics. It is arbitrary, completely arbitrary. Now you say, well, there are many things in physics that are arbitrary, right? Constants of nature are arbitrary. Laws of physics themselves are arbitrary in some sense, right? So I want to compare and contrast the arbitrariness of strong path hypothesis with the usual kind of okay arbitrariness of constant nature. Natural constant, remember, are also arbitrary. They have exact values, even though they cannot be deduced from first principles. But they have effects in the material world in the following sense. Typically in most worlds, any slight changes in the values of natural constants will be reflected in the material condition of the world and they will change the minimal lifestyles from possible to impossible. For example, change the value G in G, M1, M2, R squared, uh, gravitational law, right? And this will make the actual world impossible. Suppose we are leaving a classical mechanical world. And similarly for other constant of nature. So any slight changes in the value constant will be reflected in how things move, how things go around, the probability of things collapses and so on. We call this property traceability. 
It is the precise values of the constants of nature, the laws of physics are traceable. They are arbitrary, but they're traceably arbitrary. It's okay. Now, an arbitrary but traceable value is arbitrary in a warranted way. It's okay. Unlike natural constants, the gamma zero in SPH is not traceable. It's arbitrary and it's untraceable. Most admissible changes in the boundary of gamma zero will not reflect any changes in the material world, right? Suppose we have some small changes in the value of gamma zero, boundary of gamma zero, the actual world will still be a member of gamma zero. The probability of events still be the same. That's the problem of normally vagueness. That is, the past hypothesis is a vague law, any precise formulation of that will be arbitrary in this projectable sense. So we call this untraceably arbitrary. Remember, so we talk about gauge as a symptom for arbitrariness, but here we don't have this gauge symptom. We don't have reduction of possibilities when we choose one over the other, right? For more details, here are some papers on archive. Um, but just informally, a theory T can be intrinsic two without being intrinsic three. A theory T may contain no so-called structure, no access structure, and does not appeal to gauge-dependent notions, but it can still contain untraceable arbitrariness in case of strong past hypothesis corresponding to conventional choices, cutoff correspondence and coarse graining. Such arbitrariness does not always correspond to a gauge degree of freedom. So choosing the weak path hypothesis over the strong one does not result in a reduction of the redundant physical possibilities in contrast to the case where say from absolute space um, to relational mechanics. You have a reduction from many to only a few. So choosing weak path hypothesis over a strong one does not give you fewer possibilities. There's not excess possibilities. So here's what I call the hardest road to nominalism. Can we find a theory that's both intrinsic two and intrinsic three? Can this be done? With some caveat, this is not possible or not plausible in the classical world, but it is possible in the quantum world. And the strategy is to combine and extend the ideas of two proposals, intrinsic QM we talked about before, and the one tacklus, which I developed in another paper, which is a version of quantum cylindrical mechanics. And this too can give you the tools to make a theory that's both intrinsic two in the sense of intrinsic QM, intrinsic three in the sense of initial projection hypothesis in the one tacklus. And that's how actually quantum theory might make fields program easier to complete if you're on the hardest road. And that's kind of a surprising result. I think quantum mechanics makes feel sort of not harder, but easier. Okay. Summary and future projects. Intrinsicality comes in many uh, uh, versions. There are at least three varieties. Intrinsic one, gauge invariance. Two, gauge free. Three, not untraceably uh, arbitrary. They may also come in degrees and connection to gauge, but they're not the same, um, right? Intrinsicality is more than just gauge independence or gauge free, so you need to avoid untraceable arbitrariness. So Fields program inspired much work on nominalism, also give uh, rise to many questions about intrinsicality. How to understand intrinsicality? Why is it desirable? Why is it important right, to keep? And how to balance it with our theoretical virtues like simplicity, predictive power, elegance, and the like. Hopefully we'll have more clarity about them in the next few years. But in this talk, I hope we have made a little bit progress about the varieties of intrinsicality. All right, that's the end for me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eddie. Um, so Hartree, do you, um, if you have some stuff you would like to say, I'm happy to open the floor to that. Yeah, let me make just a, a couple of uh, uh, brief remarks. Um, uh, first of all, um, Eddie, Eddie mentioned this uh, letter from Quine. Uh, I should say that although Quine was very polite and said some nice things, I was uh, disappointed that my book didn't in the end influence his views, but I'm really pleased that my views in uh, science without numbers have since been endorsed by an even more in influential figure um, I'll, I'll give you a quote. I think you'll know who it's from. Fake numbers that they made up and don't even exist. 
that's uh, at real Donald Trump. Um, I, I wish I could do the Alec Baldwin voice, but I was unable to do that. Um, okay, uh, uh, on to more substantive matters. Um, so, look, I, um, I, I agree about the in, in, in intrinsicality one versus in, in, in intrinsicality two. We need gauge freedom, not just gauge invariance for reasons that I think uh, Eddie gave. Uh, and uh, and uh, the gauge freedom, the stronger it nation was uh, part of my project. Um, I like I like his um, um, I like his way of achieving intrinsicality in in uh, quantum mechanics. It seems exactly right to me. Um, it is on configuration space, which which means the question that as to whether uh, it, it's a nominalistic approach um, uh, is not so clear, but as Eddie said, uh, in, in intrinsicality was in some ways the more important uh, 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 desiderata for me though, uh, because I had a little trouble making the notion precise, I ended up focusing on, on, on the nominal. And, and, and that was important too, but, but, uh, but um, uh, so even, even if the, the uh, version of uh, quantum mechanics that he, he gives us doesn't achieve phenomenalism, um, it's in, important that it does achieve the intrinsicality. Um, as for the third notion of in, in intrinsicality three, well, well, of course, I'm against gratuitous arbitrariness. I mean, who wouldn't be? But um, I don't really get the example. I mean, it, it, it depends on this idea that, that these non-dynamic things like the past high, high hypothesis count as in an important sense laws. And I guess I just don't need, I, I don't see the, the um, the the need to make a distinction between those initial micro st states which don't exist and those that couldn't. I mean, as uh, Max said, the universe is only a given once, and uh, um, so the notion of a dynamic law has has um, has a clear import, I think, but but the task of distinguishing between those initial microstates, which are um, uh, uh, um, uh, which are which are uh, un unwarlike and those which really don't obtain, I, I, I just don't understand the virtue. So maybe there are some other kinds of examples of gratuitous um, arbitrariness that we should eliminate, but, but um, I don't get that example. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay, let's give, uh, Eddie can um, take a moment to respond, but then we'll go to questions um, in, for a few minutes on the hand raise function. Yeah, thank you so much, Hartree. Uh, yeah, lots of interesting ideas, and I just want to take a brief moment to respond to what you say here. So the first one I want to say is that um, I like that you like uh, intrinsic QM, but I want to emphasize that it's not only, I mean, uh, it's compatible with configuration space fundamentalism, but it's also compatible with physical space fundamentalism. So the relata can be either points in configuration space or a bunch of points in physical space. So in that sense, you can preserve fundamentality, priority, physical space, and think of configuration space as kind of a uh, um, convenient shorthand. But the fundamental predicates are the same and the axioms are the same. Um, so I think can introduce both intrinsic quality too and nominalism uh, in the sense of uh, a cycle of the numbers. Um, and the, the question about past hypothesis is super interesting. Um, so I, uh, I assume in the paper that it is uh, plausible to give it a status fundamental law of nature. Of course, it's controversial, uh, but I do think there are good grounds for this argument. 
so for example, if we think that um, the second law of thermodynamics is a law of nature, and if it can be deduced from other laws only by adding the past hypothesis to f equals ma or Schrodinger equation, then that give the past hypothesis a QA status, right? If it's not a law, this contingent initial condition. So the initial condition could be created something else in phase space or Hilbert space. And that will make the second law nomologically contingent. And that seems wrong. We're just part of uh, our conviction the second law is one of the most important law of life, not just physics, but life. The passing of youth, the, uh, you know, the decay of the Republic and so on, right? It's kind of the law of nature, still so deeply ingrained in our conviction about scientific structure of the world. Um, but also if you are, uh, have kind of a human perspective about laws of nature, you kind of a direct argument from synthetic art informativeness to PhD in front of an axiom in the best system. Now you have a kind of minimal anti-human view that doesn't require production dynamical laws, but can think that the best system give us some epistemic clues on what kind of laws should be. And we can take them to be defeasible guides. The minimal primitivism about laws, which I'm trying to develop with uh, Charlie Goldstein, my co-author, allows or actually suggests we take the past hypothesis to be a fundamental governing law. Governing the sense not producing T1, T2 from T1, but in terms of constraining the space of possibilities. I think knowledge doesn't have to take possibility as seriously as fundamental, but they're important part of theoretical um, scientific um, tools and we have to recover them somewhat from logical operators plus laws plus ontology. Um, but there must be a room for them to play in our theorizing. And I think that this important theorizing tools should not be abandoned to these anomalies. Oh, sorry, yeah. So just to wrap up, um, thank you, Hartree, really that's super helpful. I think, um, um, yeah, if I come up with other examples, I'd like, I'd like to know too. Okay, let's go to um, Ian for the first question. Oh, yeah, you're muted. Uh, you are muted. Sorry, you. Once again with uh, sound. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the talk. The example is I'm thinking of is probability. It seems to be, it, it's a pure number. It's not dimensional and therefore it's gauge free. And yet it involves an on, apparently an ont ontology of numbers. So you have, uh, intrinsicality, but some sort of realist, uh, at least on the surface, some sort of realist account of numbers. Yeah, I think have a continuum of real numbers. It can be characterized intrinsically, but it's not nominalistic. Um, so if you want to have both intrinsicality and nominalism, um, then you have to do something else without numbers. And probabilities, I guess, be carried out in terms of, so probability is the big question now in nominalism, the hard, hard road. I don't know how hard it feels about this, but I feel like, well, I don't really have a handle. I think about in one way, not another way, different days. So physical probabilities are hard. And I think of them as comparative relations, but what are the relata? The relata can be, I guess, maybe chunks of space time, um, can be one relata, um, but has been worked out in detail. So my yeah, preferred yeah. approach is to think of the real probabilities um, as the one that required by the past hypothesis, but that can be taken care of by the density matrix. So it can be taken care of by intrinsic QM. So you don't need probabilities in that. But the Bowman probability is about configuration particles is a different case. I just think the example supports your separation of intrinsicality from nominalism. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I mean, there might be a nominalist solution, but it seems right, right. Uh, the problem's not um, gauge in, gauge dependence. I see. Right. I um I think there is is a nominal solution. I mean, the basic idea is to have a, a four place conditional probability comparison as a, a basic. And, and as Eddie said, there's a, a Question as to what the relata are. If you um, if, um, and 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 this is it's going to get into the issue of what you take the relation between credence and 
uh, physical probability to be, but uh, without getting in 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 into that, I I think that the uh, the the um, um, the uh, 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 comparative conditional probability approach is the way to go to handle the nominalism problem. Yeah. Um, sometimes I say it's everyone's problem how to interpret probabilities. But uh, for nominalists, I guess, we have to be explicit about the relata and the relations. And that's where it became more difficult. For the Platonists, they can evoke that part of mathematics in the best system with the laws. Uh, they don't have to worry about relata that much. Uh, they don't have to solve the problem of principle principle. But the nominalists seem to have, uh, I don't know, sometimes a greater burden to demonstrate what probabilities are. Okay, let's go to Casper uh, Jacobs. We have time for another question. Hi, um, thanks very much for your talk. So I have a question about the relation between uh, this notion of intrinsic to and um, arbitrariness. So I can see how a lack of intrinsic one uh, induces arbitrariness because for example, it's arbitrary whether my models uh, refer to mass in kilograms or in pounds. Um, but I'm not sure whether the same arbitrariness occurs when we don't have intrinsic two. So mm. if I take the equivalence class of my models uh, under some symmetry group, in a sense, that equivalence class itself isn't arbitrary, right? Because that's the only equivalence class uh, under that group of symmetries. The, the individual models there are arbitrary, but as a group, it's sort of uniquely picked out. So I think it's still bad to have that equivalence class because it doesn't give you a sort of an intrinsic or as perspicuous representation, but I'm just not sure if um, arbitrariness is really the problem there. Mm -hmm. uh, is the question whether implicit two still contains arbitrariness? Right, yeah, if arbitrariness is sort of the best way to spell out what's problematic about a theory that lacks intrinsic two. I see, I see, right. I think it's related to arbitrariness, but maybe it's more um, accurate to say it's about surplus or excess structure. Um, there is some kind of, I mean, intrinsic zero uh, theories are those that are <laughs> having dep uh, gate dependent quantities, privileged in particular coordinate system. And uh, you can reduce the space of possibilities from intrinsic zero to intrinsic one, taking equivalence classes. And going from intrinsic one to intrinsic two, there's no reduction in possibility. Um, so in essence, there's no further reduction of, um, uh, of surplus structure. Um, so yeah, I think the move from one to two is about explanations or deeper kind of um, description of reality. And there's a question whether intrinsic two states are uh, arbitrary in themselves can postulate um, greater than or equal to relation or less than or equal to relation. <laughs> you have this reverse relations and which one is more fundamental, which one is uh, derived. And that's the kind of deep question of logic. Is conjunction more fundamental than disjunction and negation and so on? And, I mean, it's a question I think Sider was trying to um, address in his book, I write the book of the world. And I don't have any particularly enlightening answer to that question. Great, thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, we'll have more time this afternoon uh, to, if anything comes up about intrinsicality, uh, to discuss it uh, in the open discussion period. Um, but for now, let's take a, a quick break um, and let's plan to come back uh, in five minutes. So keeping to Eddie's yesterday super um, punctual five minute schedule, we'll plan to come back at uh, 1.07. West Coast time.